so it's, it's my absolute pleasure to um, have Jane Secker come along and speak to us um, at this session. Um, I've known Jane for some time. Um, Jane made me come to the, a, a lilac session, a lilac conference some years ago, um, and I got hooked and I've, I've never been away really. I've been to most uh, lilacs in one way or another um, since that time. Um, and I've been very, very, Glad to have Jane um, in all sorts of ways to help and support. Um, of course, Jane uh, came to Cambridge for a three month um, slot back in 2011, which we were chatting about a little earlier if you were listening. And we had a great time um, in Cambridge at that time. So, really, really pleased to have Jane um, come and, and talk to us. Jane is currently at City um, University as a senior lecturer there. Um, and we're really pleased to have her come and share some, uh, some of her views and thoughts on information literacy training. Thank you, Jane. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, delighted to be here. Well, not delighted to be on Zoom. I would have been more delighted to have actually been um, in Cambridge, which is one of my favourite places um, in the world, I think. Um, hopefully you can see my slides now. Yes. So, uh, and I will um, get started. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be talking at this event and I've enjoyed, um, enjoyed Ruth Carlyle's um, session. She did a fantastic keynote a couple of years ago at Lilac as well. Um, and uh, I think it set us up really nicely actually for the importance of information literacy um, at the moment. So I'm gonna focus on um, moving online um, which is something we've all um, in, in education had to do quite rapidly, I think, um, uh, since um, March and the, the, the current sort of crisis um, situation that we're in. Um, so, I'll, but I'll just start by just, um, if, if you don't know me, I'll just sort of tell you a little bit um, about uh, my background um, and how I sort of came to be where I am. Um, that's a rather, um, uh, I don't know what we call it. Is that my lockdown hair photo or something? Uh, a picture of me taken last year actually at the Creative Commons Summit. Um, and um, but this is me many many years ago um, when I went to Aberystwyth. Um, I I am a librarian. Um, I did my uh, library and information studies as it was called then, um, undergraduate degree with history, um, and uh, went on actually to do a PhD. So. Um, thought for um, a while when I was young that I wanted to be a lecturer and then I kind of had this crazy idea that actually it was it was kind of really important to get some experience uh, working in the library profession before I went on to sort of teach in that field. Um, so I went sort of several different directions. The first job I did, I worked at the Natural History Museum, worked on a project that was looking at access to journal collections um, and how that might be changing. Obviously a lot of things related to digitization um, were going on. I went to work at UCL on a project, um, which um, I think is, is, is kind of something that's a theme that's run throughout my whole career. It was about putting course materials online and what the, um, issues were around um, how to do that with regard to digitization, copyright, um, and, and also um, the benefits to learning as well. And then for the bulk of my career, many of you uh, may know, I worked at the London School of Economics. I worked in the learning technology um, team, but as a librarian, helping advise staff. Um, I'm gonna go back to my time working at LSE um, in a moment because it was really pivotal that role and actually some of the lessons I learned then about shifting information literacy online um, I think are probably relevant today as well. Um, but now I'm at City University, I've been there for three, just over three years, I'm a senior lecturer and I'm not teaching in the library school which is one of the things people often think um, I do, but I'm, I teach in educational development. I run, I, I'm the deputy director of our masters in academic practice, which is taken by lecturing staff in the main. Um, and um, it's a qualification accredited uh, by the Higher Education Academy. Um, it's, I, I run modules on educational technology. I also run a module specifically on um, digital literacy and open practice. Um, and then as a kind of, I guess, as a professional hobby, I'm pretty interested in um, information literacy. Um, was one of the founder members of the group uh, many, many years ago, um, co-founded the Lilac Conference and 
um, increasingly interested also in, in copyright literacy and copyright literacy um, is, is very much aligned, I think, with um, you know, understanding what we can and can't do with, with information when we want to share it. And that's particularly topical, obviously, at the moment. Um, many of us wanting to, um, to make material available and to share it. And um, I think just to talk about information literacy, um, and um, so I've, I've been the chair of the SILIP Information Literacy Group now for five years, um, and um, been involved in this group, as I say, pretty much since the outset. And I think one of the, the things I'm probably most proud of is the work that we did a few years ago to, um, to sort of redefine information literacy, to update um, what was quite a, a traditional view of, of information literacy and to create a new definition which was launched in April um, 2018 um, and was really to sort of emphasise, so I'll just put that up on the screen so you can read it, that information literacy is the ability to think critically and make balanced judgments about the information we find and use. And it empowers us as citizens to develop informed views and to engage fully with society. I was very much influenced by the work um, that UNESCO had done around information literacy, but I really wanted us to sort of try to shift information literacy to be more than just finding and evaluating information. It was that, that, that kind of critical um, aspect of it to help us make balanced judgments. And Ruth highlighted that, that so clearly, I think, um, in her keynote this morning, that how difficult that actually is for people, that information literacy is very much um, linked to, to all sorts of other abilities now, uh, people's ability to use technology, um, people's ability um, to, to, to actually listen, um, you know, to communicate effectively as well. There's a, a role for all of us here. Um, you know, information is sometimes very, very complex. Statistical information, health information is very complex. And so information literacy is not just about being able to find it. We all need to be able to think crit critically um, about information and, and you know, perhaps to sort of say when, when we don't understand something, well, no, I don't know what that means and I need, I need that explained in a different way. Otherwise, I think we can't develop these sort of informed views. We can't engage fully um, with society. We can't make decisions about our health. And at the moment, obviously, that's something we're all particularly um, focused on as well. Um, one of the things we did with the definition was really try to show that information literacy wasn't just something you needed um, as a, a kind of an academic theoretical skill, something that would help you if you went to university um, to, to understand, you know, how you might um, write an essay and find the information you needed. Information literacy is, is much, much broader and at its broadest level it is an everyday life skill and I saw a comment in the chat box from someone saying why is this not taught um, to people? Well, I, I, I quite frequently jump up and down and wonder why? Why? Why do people not demand that this is embedded into, you know, it throughout life is not something um, that everybody um, you know, should have a right to, 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 to get some sort of education in because it is, I think it is absolutely fundamental um, to the decisions we make in our daily life, to the decisions we make uh, when we vote, when we participate in society. Obviously it's important in education, but it's massively important in the workplace and in health. So we have um, plenty of information. We had um, a, a big sort of launch event around this definition of information literacy. And um, the group are very committed really to sort of, you know, trying to, to spread the, the public understanding of what this is. Um, there is an article um, about the terminology, because I noticed some people talking about the terms. It's been called information literacy for more than 40 years. And I, I think there is, you know, I, I think 10, 15 years ago, I wanted to stop conversations about changing what we call it um, and just accept this is what it is. But I, I am aware that those discussions do um, uh, have a, a tendency to, to continue as well. Um, but, you know, when... 
when I speak about information literacy to academic staff, I, I tend to ask them about things like critical thinking. I don't necessarily use the words. Um, I say, well, librarians tend to call this information literacy. You might know it as another term. You might think of it as digital literacy. You might think of it as people's kind of critical um, thinking skills. You, you can think about it, um, you can call it different things. But why does it matter now? So in this kind of time of, um, you know, a real sort of health crisis, um, I think that, that really we should be even more so jumping up and down and, and, and shouting about the importance of information literacy um, in, in all sorts of areas um, because of some of the reasons I've outlined. And um, a couple of really big organisations are actually finally um, starting to do something about it. So um, just um, a month or so ago, um, the BBC, um, as part of their bite-sized resources, which are resources for school-aged children, they have a whole set of resources linked to the national curriculum for all the different key stages, but they also have a set of resources um, that are broader than that. And BBC Bite Size have developed um, this set of resources around um, fake news, misinformation. It's called Fact or Fake. Um, the, there's a link at the end of my slides if you haven't seen it. And it's also highlighted on the information literacy website because we've been working with them. Um, some of the members of our committee feature in some of the resources um, really to, to, to kind of highlight to young people the importance of information literacy. Um, and if you don't believe the BBC, well, what about the UN? So um, uh, just uh, yesterday, we put up a blog post about a campaign from the United Nations that the Information Literacy Group are really keen to support. Um, it's called Pause, and there will be a lot about this on social media um, next week on the 30th of June. And it is really about thinking before you share information. It's about misinformation. Um, and I think that that campaign is something that's really important for the library community um, to get involved in as well and, and to sort of show the role that we can play as well um, there. So there's a little bit more about that. But I mean, essentially what they're asking you to do on the 30th of June um, is um, to, 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 to use this phrase around pausing to take care before you share. Um, think about, um, you know, the information. Um, and, and think about the impact that it might have if you share fake news or misinformation. So there's a hashtag um, and there will, I'm sure, be um, lots going on, on on Twitter. But you can have a look at the, the IL um, website if you want to find out a bit more about that campaign. Um, IL in a time of crisis, though. Um, I mean, I think, you know, there is a clear role for um, the library and information community here. Um, I think one of the, um, the, the kind of key things which I've highlighted is really about tackling, I mean, maybe not just misinformation about COVID-19, but confusing, baffling, conflicting information and helping people make sense of it. That seems to me um, to be a really important role. So we've been highlighting um, on the um, information literacy website. Um, good quality sources of information about COVID-19. We've got a set of resources that we've been adding to um, over the time of the crisis. I think many of us um, who uh, have been helping support um, the shift to online learning that's going on. And, and here, this is where I've been doing a lot of um, work around copyright and licensing. One of the kind of things that's obviously um, become quite clear is that many of the texts that are used in teaching are not available um, in digital format or not available in a, a way that is um, affordable um, to our institutions. Um, so helping provide resources, sometimes open educational resources may be the answer here, um, to support um, teachers as they shift to online learning is really important. The topic of what I'm going to talk about today is obviously and what you're going to work on is thinking about teaching information literacy online. So a very, very clear role here for the library community is, is to actually do some of our teaching um, of information literacy online. And um, I'm going to talk about some findings um, from a recent survey that Sarah Pavey and I um, did on behalf of the information literacy group. Um, and then what we've been doing there 
is, is using that survey as a way to highlight and encourage people to come forward um, with case studies of good practice. Um, and we've got a couple of those case studies um, that are, are on the website already. Um, we're, we're adding to that all the time. We had um, over 30 people offering to share case studies um, of the work that they were doing. So if you've got, if you've got um, an idea for a case study, please get in touch with me afterwards as well. If you're doing something you'd like to highlight. Okay, so because uh, as my original background is as a historian, I, I do like to start with a little bit of history. Um, and um, if my uh, former colleague from LSE, Maria Bell, is on this call, she may, in the depths of her memory, uh, trawl back to 2003, um, when the two of us trotted up to Glasgow to a conference that was called the ELIT conference. It was held at Glasgow Caledonian University, predated Lilac um, even being created. And um, Maria and I presented on the um, the work that we were doing. It was still work in progress, just like to point out, obviously we were refining the icons and the appearance of our WebCT information skills training course that we were developing at the time. So actually when I was appointed at LSE, part of my role was um, to look at shifting um, information skills training, as we called it then, um, online. And um, we had the, the VLE WebCT. So this is, um, this, is, this is just a screenshot. I had to actually trawl this out from a, 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 an external hard drive where I've got a few files on um, because there is no evidence of this conference ever even taking place on the internet anymore, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Um, but I do have my slides, fortunately. Um, and I'll just have to show you some of the things that we were actually thinking um, to do with this course. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting and revolutionary for its time. Um, and the idea actually had come from the fact that surely we're spending far too much time running workshops for students that they don't turn up to. Let's shift this all online and this will be the answer. This will revolutionise uh, the way we teach students information literacy. So we had um, this, this uh, link actually to the courses that were running. You can see some of the exciting courses that were running at LSE Library in, back in 2003. Um, the West Law course, basic info skills about how to modify a search and um, uh, some EndNote training, of course. So uh, some of this uh, uh, sort of stuff never goes away. What we um, also did was we linked through to information that was on the library website that we felt people perhaps might find more easily when they were in the VLE. Um, we had um, a quiz. We were really ahead of the time here. We brought in some interactivity um, and um, we had a discussion forum as well. I have to say it was tumbleweed in our discussion forum. There was not a huge amount going on in that forum um, but we did have quite a, a range of materials that students could also work through so we had an online tutorial um, and um, we did things like monitor how many students were using it i think you can probably guess um, that it didn't change the world back in 2003 um, it did get maria and i um, a trip to glasgow and onto the sort of conference circuit so um, there was there was definitely merit in what we were doing but I think these, these sort of early days of uh, you know, shifting this material online, it was very much about providing complementary resources. We used to share the slides from sessions, but really we were you know, focusing, I think, on, on a lot of face-to-face -face sessions. Um, now, in my job at the moment, um, the kind of the key area that I work in is supporting um, staff to use technology in their teaching. So I thought what I would do now is kind of just highlight a few principles of um, online learning that I would share briefly with you um, that might be helpful, um, you know, if you're looking to shift your information literacy um, online. I have to say that much of what I put together back in 2003 was very much um, done sort of a, a, in a way that made sense to me. So I wasn't particularly guided by any sort of framework. I did think it was going to be important to build in interactivity. Um, but um, this was sort of pre me doing any form of teaching qualification. So it was really about sort of putting some resources up. 
But I think the, the sort of principles I would now, if I was starting again, be guided by um, is particularly um, to be guided by learning outcomes. So um, some of you, I'm sure, may be familiar um, with uh, this principle of writing smart learning outcomes. So learning outcomes that are specific, that are measurable, that are attainable, that are relevant and that are time framed. So there's a particular way of writing learning outcomes and when you're in your breakout groups you're going to have a go at writing um, some learning outcomes for a session but I do think um, it's really important to be guided by this and not by technology I have, I have to say back in 2003 I think the fact we had a VLE we had WebCT was very much guiding us and saying we must use it in some kind of way to make this material available um, I think the next thing really um, is to, to, and again, um, uh, this, you know, comes a lot now from um, what I would teach people who are designing any sort of learning is to plan some actual appropriate learning activities that mean that, that students can actually, um, you know, that are aligned to the learning outcomes. So what you do not want to be doing is planning a one hour sort of monologue of you recording a voiceover uh, PowerPoint. Um, you want, you know, you want there to be some active learning going on in your session. You need some activities that students have to do. It might be some things they do before they come to the session. There might be things they do in the session and then there might be things they can do after the session. But I think it is about trying to build in those opportunities for for active learning. So I think, you know, information literacy is not a theoretical um, skill. It's it's really it, it, it's a skill. It's not knowledge in some ways. It's it's things that you've got to be able to practice. And then um, I think the next sort of idea really is um, to make sure that you have lots of opportunities for getting feedback. And there are tools that are available um, in um, virtual classrooms, in Zoom, you know, whatever it is you're using, if it's Microsoft Teams, you know, voting tools, polls, we, we use some of those this morning. You can use tools that are outside of, um, you know, that where students go off um, and, and use something like Padlet or, or Jamboards. We're going to have a go at using some of those today as well. But, you know, provide opportunities where you're actually getting feedback. And we were very conscious today that if we had large numbers of people that just assuming if I pause and say, does anyone want to ask any questions that that's, you know, the best way of managing that. Um, hence why we're trying the breakout groups to, to bring in some more interactivity. Um, at City, we are guided now by some sort of high level um, principles um, that have been devised around um, online learning with the kind of the, the, the shift um, that happened, obviously, um, in the, the summer term, spring, summer term, um, and then what we're planning for the autumn. And so I thought I'd just share a few of those um, principles with you as well. Um, I think flexibility is absolutely key. Um, I'm not quite sure why PowerPoint created this funny little robot to indicate uh, flexibility, but um, I, I, I always think, you know, it's great to do something live, synchronous like today, but it's also really important to have resources that are available, available to people at a time that they can consult them. So recordings, whether they're resources that people can work through in their own, um, in their own time. Um, accessibility, I think, is really important as well um, when you're starting to um, think about designing materials. We've got the um, accessibility regulations that kick in in September um, 2020 for sort of public sector websites, which are affecting VLEs as well. So it's something it's worth talking to your learning technology team about. Um, if you're designing your materials, how you can put things like subtitles. We've been playing around yesterday with um, the Google Slides and subtitles that you can put on um, Google Slides. Um, read up a bit. I mean, I'm not saying that I expect you all to become experts in pedagogy, but um, I do think, you know, there's a huge amount written. So read up on um, learning design. Um, and models like ABC, so this comes from the work of originally from um, Diana Lorillard, but it's UCL um, and the Institute of Education there. 
um, and Clive Young and Natasha per Perovic developed this ABC model, which is really helpful for blended learning. So that will be worth you having a look at if you're not familiar with it. And think about community as well. I, I realise that that can be quite problematic um, if you're just doing one-off sessions, but anything you can do to build in a sense of community is really important. So just really quickly before you go into your breakout groups, what I'd like to do is just present a few quick findings um, from a survey. Um, so sort of a, back in kind of April time, um, Sarah Pavey and I um, in the information literacy group were talking about um, how we could best support um, uh, librarians with the shift to online learning and, and one of the things we wanted to see was kind of like well what is actually going on both of us were kind of interested in collecting a bit of information about how people were responding and what sort of challenges and opportunities there might be um, and so we've had so far we've had 95 responses to our survey mainly from people in universities um, it's still ongoing and the survey's still open, so um, I can I can share that uh, with you at the end if you haven't um, contributed to it and you'd like to. But also we've had a lot of, um, you can see a significant number of people in schools who um, uh, contributed to the survey as well. So what we were kind of primarily asking them was about, well, what are you doing with regard to information literacy and what subjects are being taught? I think this is interesting that top of the list was actually finding and evaluating information and using specific databases and resources. They were the biggest and then referencing and plagiarism um, came next in the list. I say these are interim findings so I didn't want to present sort of percentages or anything further. We're going to be doing a report about this. Some of you are teaching in the area, unsurprisingly, about dealing with mis disinformation, fake news. Uh, smaller numbers are, are teaching in the area of copyright, open access, scholarly comms and academic writing. And then there was a range of other subjects, but mainly that were just mentioned by one or two people. Uh, which technologies were being used? Uh, lots and lots of different technologies were mentioned, different webinar platforms, um, you can see there Teams, Zoom, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, Adobe Connect, Skype, all sorts of things. People using video creation tools, some doing narrated PowerPoint, using uh, Microsoft Sway, some using Kaltura, iMovie. Some using the lecture recording systems and the kind of personal capture tools that those have available. Some people were developing actually specific things like online tutorials using some of the kind of authoring tools like Xerti or Camtasia. Some people were pointing or developing more online resources and guides. Uh, we had voting tools, quiz tools being used, and then quite a lot of people using um, free tools and Google tools or things like Google Classroom. Um, that was used, I think, in some of the, the schools. So lots of different technologies being used, but challenges. And the biggest challenge everybody said was student engagement. Now it's either whether they thought that students were listening and, and watching or just kind of zoned out during a session um, or how to work out whether students were engaged with what they were doing. A um, lot of people struggling with technical difficulties and actually a lot of that was to do with Wi-Fi when people were working at home and their broadband connectivity but some people obviously dealing with things like their laptop they'd come home you know not set up to work from home so that was challenging. Time, a huge issue, and I'm sure that won't come as a surprise. Obviously, time to prepare and to learn new tools. Um, some concerned about their students' digital literacy um, skills and their ability to kind of use various platforms. Balancing um, work and life was also a really big theme and, and a number of, um, and I'm aware obviously in our, our profession we have quite a high percentage of um, females and, and, and child caring responsibilities we've seen a lot in the news has fallen predominantly on women um, during these times. So saying things like, well, I'm, I'm literally trying to rub a, run a webinar and um, homeschool at the same time, quite a challenge. Um, and some mentioning that they really felt they'd sort of, you know, there was a lack of support or training available. They'd had to learn a lot um, uh, on the job. But opportunities as well. And pretty much everyone said, I just had to dive in, learn a whole load of new stuff out of necessity. 
um, people saying they thought it was great for flexibility for their students and actually some people saying I think I'm reaching more students than I ever do have done before and I'm spending more time with them and in fact this works better for me because I can teach in a more flexible way and I'm seeing potentially an increased demand for my time um, that, that I, I'm aware that that is um, you know not to sort of play down the huge challenges that there are so that's just a little bit of a flavour um, I would like to get you to go into um, your breakout groups um, in a moment and I think um, my wonderful assistants in Cambridge are going to help us um, manage that. Um, so what, just to let you know what you're going to do, and you have had some pre-session um, uh, information about this. So we're going to put you in a group that's probably going to have around 10 people in it. As Libby said, there is no um, dedicated moderator. So somebody will have to just sort of volunteer, I think, to, to, to capture what you're doing um, and to, to be prepared um, to sort of take some notes or something. Now there's a list of topics, so you're going to develop an online information literacy session and but you can choose in your group from a list of topics that you've had. It's quite a broad um, set of categories, um, but it, there will be an element of choice here and you can choose things like how many students, the level, the subject, the discipline, the time that you're going to have allocated. But just bear in mind, um, we'll assume that you've got some sort of voting um, tools, you've got a virtual classroom, you've got chat and things like that available. You should have had a look at what was in the Google Doc so I'm hoping uh, when you go into the groups it should be clear but when you come back you're going to have 20 minutes I think if that's if we're okay for time still. Um, that might be a bit tight we're finishing at 12 30 aren't we should we give people 15 minutes? Yeah we'll give them 15 so we're going to give you a warning when we bring you back um, a couple of minutes before we'll bring you back I think at 20 past 12 um, so you're going to have to be quick. Um, and um, what I want you to do is um, try to just have a, a scope out of this, a, a very rough plan. Um, if you can, try and devise some learning outcomes for your session and think about some appropriate activities. To be honest, you may just end up chatting in your groups um, about what you've done so far, um, what you thought of what I've been saying, um, but we've got some um, uh, are they Padlets or are they Jamboards? What have we got, Libby? Um, they're, they're Padlets and they've done quite a You've probably seen them, so they're divided up in group one to ten. Just nab a group and put something, a comment in one of the group columns and then that becomes your column to add things to. Yeah, okay. So, should be clear. Um, we'll bring you back, um, as I say, in after 15 minutes if you go off now and um, I'll, I'll have a look and see if there's been any questions while you're away. I'm going to stay here in the main room. So um, if, if Isla can work some sort of magic, um, hopefully... I'm about to work the magic. Prepare to leave into your breakout room. Okay. okay. Probably, I think from what Libby's just told me, a lot of you um, gravitated towards the literature searching um, topic um, and had a go at devising um, a session. Um, would anybody um, like to um, share um, in the chat, um, anything in your group that you talked about that was interesting. In the main room, we were still kind of having some conversations about, um, you know, really what is best practice here? What should we be doing? Should we be shifting um, our, our sort of, you know, drop in sort of type information literacy sessions online? Is that helpful? Should we be focusing only on delivering embedded sessions? Um, I, I certainly think we need to be um, talking a lot to our academic colleagues and offering them support and I'll say a few words um, in conclusion but um, can I just give the groups a moment to just see what sort of things I'll try and have a look at the chat as well um, and I'm sure you didn't have enough time to do anything um, and I know some of my um, ILG colleagues are on here so we'll perhaps be getting some ideas about a, a follow-up event and um, give you a bit more time. Um, so not enough time, some people are saying. Um, any, any, any groups um, have any really great ideas of the sorts of things, um, you know, sort of activities that you could plan? Um, someone's asked me to in define an embedded session. So in, by that, I mean um, a session that you would run as part of um, a module. So 
you would run it for a group of students you know a lecturer would probably ask you to say my sociology students need a literature searching session and can you come in and do it as part of uh, their module so that's how i define um embedded it's sort of integrated into the curriculum it's not a sort of session that's just offered standalone by the library students come along if they have a need it's actually delivered um, in conjunction with academic staff so some people were talking about some of the difficulties of flipped classroom um, and I understand there was some discussion, Libby and I talked about this, about how to build a community as well and how to engage students um, and I think that's an area where um, people need quite a lot of um, you know, advice and guidance about building that sense of community online. Okay. How to take a hands-on activity online using worksheets. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 I think it's, it's very challenging. And I think actually getting students to go off and do something hands-on, just even just now sending you off to breakout groups for 15 minutes, I suspect if you sent your students off to do something online in a group, they would probably spend most of the time just chatting, working out the technology and not actually get a chance to do those activities. Um, we're getting a lot of things shared there and I'm just kind of conscious of time as well. So it may be something, if I can have a look at the chat afterwards, Libby, and perhaps we can respond to some of that afterwards too. I, I think there's one just interesting comment about the time um, from Marta. She says, we had an interesting chat about the duration of the session. Should we do shorter sessions because they're online or can we include a break? Mm. That's a useful question. Mm. I mean, I'm I'm tending to um, do a session and have a short break, a little bit like you did this morning, and then bring people back again. Um, but but kind of try to keep it quite focused. One of the things I've also been doing is if I'm literally just delivering content, I've tried to think about whether I could just make a, a short video or a voiceover PowerPoint and and make that available before. I know I had a conversation with Coco about you know some of the challenges if you make materials available before then may students just not come to sessions as well but um yeah posting a five minute video to watch during the break that's exactly the kind of thing um i've done as well i, I i've been teaching um a morning session having quite a big break where people do activities and then bringing them back at the end of the day on one of my modules and i've asked them specifically to do things like watch a couple of videos in the break post to the discussion forum but I'm aware that's a kind of a four credit module so that's a bit of a different um, approach but I, I think I think we need to to, to be experimental in this time um, and um, you know I, I don't think I, I have all the answers and I was very aware I don't have all the answers okay I'm gonna move on just so I can wrap up and, and, and conclude because I, I want to try and finish on time if I can but I will be around if anyone's got questions um, at the end and they can stay on um, I do think that um, we are all you know this this is very challenging times and we are all having to try and adapt what we do um, and um, you know we're all learning um, a lot at the moment and um, you know there isn't necessarily um, one uh, one approach. Um, everybody I think has very big concerns about students not engaging with learning if we shift it online particularly most of the academic colleagues I've been talking to are hugely concerned about that, hugely concerned um, that uh, students are going to drop out of courses um, and um, there's a really nice, so I've got a link at the bottom um, to this uh, blog post that's from Amber Thomas who is um, the head of uh, sort of digital education, online learning um, at Warwick, I think, um, to think about what you're doing at the moment. So when you're developing your online teaching, um, so she was, she's written about what we all did in the kind of uh, the, the, the sort of the, the summer term um, or the sort of spring term. And, and that was kind of a bit like fast food. We were just having to respond really, really quickly to the pandemic, shift stuff online. Lots of people talk, call it emergency remote teaching. 
Um, but what we're not attempting to do is turn everybody into the open university either. So that's your kind of Michelin starred restaurant. What we're trying to do is what, what she describes as quality home cooking. So you're kind of this in this middle ground when you're developing online learning, you've got a bit more time, you're going to do something, you know, really good quality, but you're never going to be, um, unless you are the open university, you know, we, we, none of us are are going to have the resources to produce you know these kind of excellent sort of videos and, and invest the amount of time i know the session that the open university did on this though was really really popular and i think there is a recording of that available they are definitely the people we should be learning um, from i do think that you should be aware that our academic staff um, and the teachers that we work with are massively stressed and challenged and challenged and so you know they may be very receptive to offers of help beyond induction um, so not just saying well I'll come in and help you know to actually say well I can help engage your students I can help them find resources I can help them with academic writing I can help them um, with the critical thinking um, so I think we do need to try where we can to get information literacy embedded in the curriculum um, you know more than ever um, what I would just want to sort of say is if you're interested um, in this, there's a link here to a campaign that I'm one of the people um, that I'm behind launching this. It's about information literacy for school education. Um, that campaign is not run by the information literacy group. It's a sort of separate group of interested people. But if you're if you think that this is really important, then consider signing um, the the your support signing the sort of petition that we've got um, and that will be really helpful um, it's it's uh, we're out of time pretty much but um, I wanted to flag up um, that some of your colleagues in Cambridge um, have written one of our first um, case studies on shifting their teaching online as I say what I want to do is collect together as many as possible of these case studies of what's working um, and, and also where where people are having real challenges as well what's not working that's what we should share so this is um, from uh, colleagues in the medical library at the University of Cambridge um, there's also a case study from the Open University we've got several more um, with some videos as well about to go up really soon um, and don't forget the, um, to pause on the 30th of June to look out for that campaign um, from the UN as well about um, information uh, and misinformation. So I'm going to stop now. Um, I do have further reading at the end and Libby will share my slides. Um, lots of resources also on the information literacy website. So thank you everybody. Thanks, Jane. That is absolutely lovely. Thank you, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've reached our 30 and, I, and I'm sure there are lots of other um, questions, but perhaps we'll go through those in the interest of just kind of keeping these things fairly tight. We will go through those on the chat. We will make sure that um, chat ideas are, um, are circulated along with um, obviously the padlets are still there so you can go back and have a look at the padlets if there's information in there that you think could be helpful too um, and um, there'll be slides and um, hopefully the recording will be available um, as soon as we can get it edited and uh, sent out to you all as well um, huge, huge thanks to Jane um, for for the the session um, Massive thanks to Isla uh, as well, who's been managing all the Zoom stuff behind the scenes. Um, it's really, really helpful. Thanks, that, thanks to Isla as well.